My story is about three worlds going on all at the same time. Um, after a very good upbringing, after a very good um, education at university, uh, studying sports psychology and business management, uh, leading into a, a pretty good career in, in retail quite early on, I uh, became a founder member of British Institute of Retail. I went into financial services in 2001. And 2001 was, um, was quite a big, a big year for me. Uh, I got married that year and I became a financial advisor. Okay? Um, from then I had a decade of three completely separate worlds running simultaneously with each other. It'll all become clear why I'm telling you this towards, towards the end. So first of all we had the career. So from 2001 to 2006 I was a top 1% financial advisor in the, in the country uh, with the bank that I worked for. Um, in 2006 I became their youngest ever regional manager and in 2010 I became a divisional director. So I had a very, very good career. Um, we um, had a lot of time in, in wealth management, investing in very wealthy clients, investing in very wealthy clients, a lot of recognition dinners, a lot of top of league tables, uh, and things like that. In 2006, becoming regional manager, I took over a region up here in the northwest, Blackpool, Southport, and Lancaster. We were 62nd out of 63 uh, of the regions in the country for investing money. Um, within two years, we've become number two and consistently top five uh, over a period of time. Um, that led to a lot of recognition within the company, um, a lot of well done, a lot of um, speaking parts about how well I was doing my job, etc. So, in theory, everything was going really, really well within the, within the um, career. At the same time, as I said, in 2001, I got married. In 2004, we had our son, Connor. In 2006, we had our daughter, Rebecca. And in 2010, we had our daughter, Georgia. So, looking in from the outside, you have got, a, you have got a, a perfect career and a perfect family going on. And, and I masked everything else really, really well. And, and, and there were telltale signs, they weren't picked up on, uh, but really, generally, the world of Paul Book looked really quite good from, um, from afar. What I also had between 2000 and, and certainly 2003 and 2011, as it, as it came about, is I, had, I suffered what they call a pathological gambling disorder. Uh, it's just been re reclassified as a disorder. Um, in that period of time, I transacted £4.8 million pounds across 93 separate betting accounts and I lost a total of £1.3 million pounds at the same time as having the perfect career and the perfect family. The really shocking side of this is it was completely hidden. Nobody knew that I gambled. My wife didn't know that I gambled, my mum didn't know that I gambled, none of my family knew that I gambled. And from 2005, none of my friends knew that I gambled because one of them had had, had, had the audacity to question me putting £750 on a horse. From then on, I didn't let anyone else in that world at all. It was completely hidden. During that time, I owned two racehorses that ran at Royal Alaska. Um, on one night at Carlisle across the country, I won £179,000 on my own horse. It had all gone with about a month. Um, I was getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning and putting 20, 30, 40,000 pounds on Brazilian football matches and Australian horse races. Things I knew absolutely nothing about. I was setting my alarm for 5 o'clock in the morning to see if it won and not really caring if they had or not. That's how far the addiction had gone. That's how enveloped my brain was from pathological gambling and that's how dangerous it can be. Um, I could go on all night with different stories, obviously with gambling transactions, I'm happy to expand you in the question thing. Um, how did it come to a head? 2011, you will all probably remember Gary Speed, the footballer, the football manager at the time of Wales, and totally unexplained, he took his own life, and nobody really knew why. Um, now, what, on November the 21st, 2011, the Independent ran a story as, surmising as to, you know, why had that happened? You know, why would Gary Speed, who'd had a 20-year football career, he'd been doing fantastically well with Wales, he had a perfect family, he shouldn't have had any money trouble. Why would he suddenly take his own life? And one of the experts, there was all kinds of, of, of connotations. Was he, was he gay? Did he have financial problems? Um, you know, did he have, was he having an affair and been found out? Loads of different reasons you know, why he would possibly do it. And a lady called Dr. Henrietta Bowden Jones, who's one of the leading addiction experts, she actually runs a national problem gambling clinic, um, wrote part of the article, did he have a gambling problem? And something within that article triggered something in my brain that nothing ever had before. I was very unusual throughout my gambling addiction that I never thought I had a problem. 
that's how illogical it is. You're getting up in the at two o'clock in the morning, putting three, three, 30 grand on a Brazilian football match, getting up at five, losing, not really caring, you still didn't realise that there was a problem going on. That's how illogical it is, that's how much it grips you. So she wrote this article, and something in that article, she could have been describing me. So she was talking about how a gambler thinks, she's talking about how a gambler acts. Um, and, and, and really, it was just me, she, she was describing me, and I had a huge realisation moment, a huge epiphany moment. Um, and for, for two weeks, pretty much, I, replayed, I stopped gambling that day. I haven't gambled since that day. It's just been over four years now. Um, but, but, but for two weeks, I, I replaced one addiction with the other. Instead of gambling almost all the time, with huge amounts, etc., I replaced that with studying what gambling was, with self-diagnosing on the internet. You know, and I was coming out with 9 out of 10, 17 out of 18, 22 out of 23, all the different worldwide measures of problematic gambling. The only one I wasn't answering affirmatively was, have you repeatedly tried to give up and not been successful? Because I'd never tried to give up. I'd convinced my brain that much that, that it wasn't a problem, so why would I try and give up? So anyway, long story short, uh, December the 8th, 2011, um, I held a meeting in Santander in Preston, which is who I work for, and that's where, where my sort of division was in there at the moment at the time. And uh, we held a meeting in the morning. At that lunchtime, Still can't explain it to this day, but at that lunchtime, something took over me. I hadn't slept, I hadn't eaten, I'd done nothing but study, study gambling addiction. I'd had a huge realisation. And during lunchtime of that meeting, I went to the top of the building, I tried to hang myself with my tie from work. And that's how low it got. That's how serious a problem gambling addiction can be. I came around four hours later, nobody knew where I'd gone. It was a totally deserted room at the top of the building. Um, I had a huge cut across my head there. My glasses were smashed. Um, it was dark outside, so just by elimination uh, investigation period, it must have been about three or four hours that I was unconscious, or certainly not, not with it. Um, I left the building by an emergency exit, leaving alarms going everywhere, and I went home. I didn't go home, went to my mum, as lads do. Uh, and I went to my mum, I explained everything. So you imagine that conversation with a mother who didn't know that the son gambled, she thought the son was, had a successful banking career, um, you know, had a, a fantastic family, but she was obviously a big part of. So you go and have that conversation, you know, transacted 4.8 million quid across 93 separate betting accounts. It's been going on eight years. Um, it's not an easy conversation to have, especially when you finish it off. I've just tried to hang myself five hours before. Okay. I then replicated that conversation with my wife that evening. And the day after, I went into work, into Santander, that same branch in Preston. And I, I unsolicited told my employers that, that £434,000 of the money that I had transacted was actually from their accounts. And I'd found a way of, of stealing money. There's no other way of putting it, of putting it across from one account into another, into mine. It was the least complex fraud in history. Um, it should have been picked up, it never was. But 434 grand from their account into mine. Um, uh, what happened then is I had seven months on bail, uh, whilst he investigated everything else, soon realised that I told them everything and given them everything. And rather than the sort of seven or eight years that you would normally get in prison for a crime like that, I got two years, eight months. And I spent in June, in June the 29th, 2012, uh, I went to Preston Prison, an old Victorian prison. Um, spent three or four weeks there and then ended up in, a, in an open prison in Kirkham for, for another year. So, where can gambling take you? It can take you from being a very successful banking executive to being in a prison cell within the space of seven months. So full responsibility for everything that I did. Um, and, and had a decision to make, you know, ultimately what happened there is it wasn't just me in prison. I, I then had three very young children without a daddy for 12 months. I had a wife without a husband for 12 months. I had a family completely stunned, shocked, not realising I'd been a gambler, left on the outside, still asking questions seven months later. I had an employer who was embarrassed about what had happened, an employer who couldn't understand why he hadn't picked it up, an employer who couldn't understand how can he be so successful at his job if he's had this five million pound gambling addiction. It just left complete and utter devastation across all, all aspects of my life. And even now, you know, this, this still sort of aftermath in certain areas. I had a decision to make. Do you leave gambling where it is as a past, past sort of episode in your life, come out 12 months later as it was, um, and, and put your head below the parapet and, and go and find a job? I was lucky to be offered in, uh, two or three jobs with people who knew me. Or do you actually use the experience of the addiction, the negative consequences of it, and actually make a difference in this field? 
And that's where Epic came from. Um, I decided very quickly we'd do an education program around problematic gambling. Uh, we'd come out and we'd use it with professional sport, the army, people like that. Um, and, and everyone would want it to try and stop something happening to one of their people that happened to me. It became very clear an education program isn't something that people would pay for. So we then won an award, we won an unlimited social impact award, and we did a 12 month pilot project for 15 companies, five small ones, five medium, and five large. Uh, and we said to them, quite simply, you know, if this is a problem, would you agree? Yes, oh, it's absolutely a problem. What was it that you would, you would, you would, you would engage with us? And there was two things. One is around reputation, organisational risk, reputation and brand and things like that, financial risk. The other is around duty of care. In May 2013, problematic gambling at compulsive and pathological level became a fully-fledged addiction under DSM-5, uh, which is the worldwide psychiatry uh, measure. Um, that changed the duty of care for every organisation who has employees in terms of providing a safe place to work. So that's what we now do. Um, we decided from that day we would work with, uh, as risk consultants, uh, reducing the risk of problematic gambling in high risk, in high risk sectors. Uh, and we currently work with professional sport, we currently work with the army, we currently work with financial services. And I also do some work with the criminal justice sector, having experienced both sides. So I work in some private prisons where there's been some pretty horrific uh, things experienced because of gambling. In terms of stats, um, Action on addiction tells problem gambling is the fastest growing addiction in the UK and globally. We know from the last national problem gambling survey in 2010 that there were 450,000 problem gamblers at that time. We also know from that time that there were three and a half million at risk of becoming problem gamblers. Since 2010, there hasn't been a national problem gambling study or a national problem gambling survey. They were stopped. Um, my question, I guess, to you as the audience is, if there were three and a half million people at risk of becoming problem gamblers in 2010, and since then we've had 1,400% more TV ads than we had in 2010, um, there's loads and loads of sport affiliation with, 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 with gambling, as we all know, um, there's a greater number of betting shops, there's the fixed odds betting terminals, as someone called about. And you know, Epic don't campaign in any way. We're not anti-gambling. We don't want gambling bans. We understand a lot. Of it. Most people gamble without problem. But you know, it is unrealistic to think that none of those three and a half million people who are at risk of problem gambling or becoming gambling addicts in 2010 didn't become gambling addicts because they've had greater exposure. They've had greater access. You know, it used to be a gambler would be someone who went with £500 into a betting shop, or even less than that, £100 into a betting shop, and he would gamble over the counter. Now you can gamble completely anonymously, 24-7, on tablets, laptops, uh, computers, etc. It's funny, I get, it's not funny at all actually, but I get a lot of people who, even though we were mainly in the workplace, of individuals contacting me and my associates, and they are literally just at rock bottom, and not knowing where to turn. Um, and most of these people, almost every one of them, is online gambling. It's people who have gambled you know, away from the families, away from the wives, at, at work. A lot of people are gambling at work. Um, so it's completely unrealistic that three and a half million would, 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 you know, would just suddenly just stop or not become at risk or, or not become full gambling at it. If we took it, even if you, if you took it that that happened, 450,000 problem gamblers is too many because of the absolutely devastating consequences that are there. Gordon Moody, which is the only residential treatment uh, for, for gambling addiction in this, in this country, um, they've just brought out a study saying that for every problem gambler, 10 people are directly affected, be that children, be that family, be that work colleagues. So even if that 450,000 people was right, that's still 4.5 million people in this country who are directly affected by problematic gambling. That's not a small amount of people. It's a small percentage in terms of how many people become gambling addicts, but four, you know, 4.5 million is not a not, not small amount. Let's take a conservative view, a logical view, that one and a half, you know, one and a half million of the three and a half now, have, now are problematic gamblers from 2010. It's probably way more than that. I haven't got any stats to prove that. It's probably way more than that. But let's say there's now two million problem gamblers in this country. If you take Gordon Moody's stat, that means there's 20 million people in this country who are directly affected by problematic gambling. 
That's nearly a third of the population. So is gambling out of control? I say yes, it probably is. And I think if you asked any of those four and a half to 20 million people who are being directly affected by it, I think they would probably give you that same answer as well, because there will be huge negative consequences. If you look at the gambling ratio, so we go from recreational gamblers, 93%, most people can keep in, in, in control of the money, most people can keep control of the, the time and the cognition. You then have an invisible line into problematic gambling, compulsive gambling, and pathological gambling. Those people who get through to pathological gambling, the evidence is there that say about 40% of them try to take their own life. That's how rock bottom it gets. You keep it hidden, you keep it anonymous, you end up normally, four out of 10 will try and take their own life. The average debt of a pathological gambler is 62,000 pounds. Not many people have got 62,000, but they can get their hands on legitimately without putting their, their family or their assets at risk. Over 90% of pathological or compulsive gamblers would relapse without the correct intervention. It's also, and I know this from personal experience, the fastest growing reason that people are being convicted and going to prison. So we know at the moment there's over a thousand convictions last year from gambling related offences. We know that over 400 of those actually went to prison. We know from a recent study with Lancaster University that 6% of the current prison population currently have gambling problems within prison. So where does that lead? Where does that lead in prison? And I've seen it firsthand, that leads to beatings, that leads to stabbings, that leads to problems on the outside of the family. Where does it lead to an individual upon release? They get 44 quid in the pocket, they've often lost the house, they've often lost, um, they've often lost an awful lot of the family connections and friends, they get 44 quid. The amount of times I'm now seeing people who get out with 44 quid and go straight to the bookies with it. We also know from the British Medical Association that gambling's got the highest comorbidity rate of any of the addictions. So that's with either another mental health condition or another addiction. It's very rare that pathological or compulsive gambling wouldn't have a drink or drug uh, effect to it as well. Probably the most frightening for me, I think, and I could give you stats all day. Um, what 60, in 2012, a study came out, and the Responsible Gambling Trust came in this study. 60,000 problem gamblers within this country are aged between 11 and 15. These are children. This is before they've even of a, of, a, of a gambling age. And yet 60,000 are problematic gamblers. Be that at school, be that in, in arcades, uh, be that using their, their mother and father's debit cards and credit cards. We've got the first tech savvy, I'm going to finish on this point now, I'm sure I've gone over. Um, we've got the first tech-savvy generation coming through. I've just done a talk with parents. Um, my 11-year-old son knows more about how to use a tablet than I do. He knows more about computers than I do. Um, you know, they are going to be able. They are being bombarded daily with either gaming or gambling advertisements or apps or anything like that. It's a ticking human time bomb. You know, it is a problem now. Gambling's out of control right now. It's going to get worse and worse. Uh, as people get older in this generation come through. I'm going to leave it there, I think. Um, I think I've given you enough, but I hope that sort of gives you a bit of a personal story into how a pretty normal guy, which is what I sort of uh, see myself with a pretty normal upbringing, with a successful career, that's what problem gambling can do to you, that's where it can take you. And I hope some of the staff that I backed it up with will convince you that, yeah, we've got a problem with this. We probably need to do something about it, um, and we probably need to do something about it quick. Um, or else it's just going to get worse and worse. Thank you for listening.